Good afternoon, everybody, and you are very welcome to our spring webinar from Advances in Communication and Swallowing, uh, which is taking place now at 12 o'clock on the 24th of April 2024. So myself, Julie Regan, and co-editor, uh, Dr. Kieran Kenny, are um, welcoming you here today. I think this is going to say our fifth webinar that we are hosting for all of our multidisciplinary readers, both at home here in Ireland and also internationally um, of our journal. Um, so today we're absolutely delighted to announce that um, Maria Gibbons um, will be presenting this webinar. Um, Maria is a clinical specialist speech and language therapist who works in pediatrics in primary care and a special language class uh, in Galway. So Maria and her co-authors, Karen Coughlin and Dr. Aoife Gallagher were awarded the best paper award in 2023 within the journal. So congratulations to them. And that award was based on a vote from the editorial boards that takes place at the end of every uh, calendar year. And um, it is based on their paper entitled Hidden in Plain Sight, a qualitative exploration of teachers and children's perspectives on supporting developmental language disorder in school. And as part of this award, um, Maria and her colleagues were invited to uh, present at this webinar. So we're thrilled to have Maria here today. So without further ado, thank you very much to Maria for presenting this afternoon. Oh, thank you, Julie, for the lovely introduction. What I might do is just share the slides and then um, get started and go, go from there. Um, apologies now. Now, hopefully everybody can see that and I will get, get going. So thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, it is an honour to be here speaking with you all today. And on behalf of my co-authors and myself, I would like to say that we are privileged to be in receipt of the ACS Best Paper Award 2023 and are delighted that it has piqued the interest of others and shone a bright light on DLD, a disorder that we feel is hidden in plain sight. So, as Julie mentioned, I'm a clinical specialist in the area of DLD um, with an interest in research. And while I have varied experience, I work predominantly with families and children in primary care, school and a special DLD class setting. Um, this research, just to give a bit of context, is the first phase of a multi-phase research completed as part of a master's in health promotion practice through Atlantic Technological University, Sligo. Um, and that master's took place during 2019 and 20 to 2021. So data collection for this research was actually gathered um, in autumn, winter 2020. So you might recall that was right in the middle of COVID. Um, this second picture is my research supervisor, Dr. Kath, uh, Karen Coughlin from ATU Sligo and co-author who supported me on the master's journey and who openly embraced the world of DLD research along the way. And the third picture is Dr. Aoife Gallagher, a person who needs no introduction here, a well-known contributor in the field of DLD and co-author in writing the research into a publishable article. So there's no surprises. Uh, today's uh, webinar will take the format of the research paper um, and I'll start with the um, introduction or the drive behind my motivation in, in taking this piece of research on board. So a little bit about DLD. It's a neurodevelopmental condition that can affect the ability to learn, understand and or remember um, and or use spoken language. And I sometimes pop in the word remember there because clinically many of the children I work with also have that difficulty with auditory memory, auditory uh, recall. Um, so despite otherwise typical development. It's a language disorder that is not associated with another biomedical condition, such as autism, intellectual impairment, genetic conditions, but can and does co-occur with difficulties with attention, such as ADHD, motor difficulties, such as dyspraxia, dysarthria, literacy difficulties, speech, executive function, adaptive behavior, behavioral problems, auditory processing, and low normal range nonverbal ability. So we know there's no single cause, but biological, genetic and environmental risk factors play a part, such as family history, being male, poverty, 
uh, low parental education, neglect or abuse um, or problems around or before the time of birth. In Ireland, it is diagnosed by a speech and language therapist, uh, most often from the age of five years onwards, so our primary school age years. And the profile of an individual with DLD can change over time and it can be lifelong. So I think ISLT define it best when they say DLD describes children likely to have language problems enduring into middle childhood and beyond with significant implications on everyday social interactions or educational uh, progress. So before I um, talk about prevalence in Ireland, I'm just going to touch a little bit on terminology. Um, as it has had an impact on our ability in Ireland to accurately record statistics and the prevalence. So as you're all aware, DLD was previously termed specific speech and language impairment by speech and language therapists. And in the Department of Education in Ireland, it was and still is termed specific speech and language disorder. So the term DLD, and apart from that, research tells us that there were over 600 different varieties of terms, which have caused lots of confusion, lots of confusion over the years. So in 2016, following the International Catalyzed Consortium, the term DLD was proposed and accepted. It has since been adopted by the SLT profession. Um, however, it, there is still an acknowledged disparity in terminology between health and education in existence in Ireland. And this has implications for service provision, particularly for the specialist DLD SSLD classes. So while robust population studies um, in other countries show prevalence rates of over 77%, with greater prevalence in lower socioeconomic groups, there is limited prevalence data uh, in the Irish context. We know there's an underreported prevalence of 6%, equating to about 70,000 children in Ireland with DLD. We know from reports in education through the NCSE, where it is termed SSLD, there is a slightly higher prevalence of 8%. Uh, Rattled tell us that 1 in 14 or 2 children in a classroom of 30 have DLD. Um, we know that DLD is more common than autism, uh, childhood hearing impairment, ADHD, but sadly it is not as well known or as well funded and resourced. So we know DLD exists, but it's under identified. Why is this? Well, identification of DLD is tricky because it is a hidden disability. It's hard to spot unless you know what to look for because you cannot see how the child's brain is processing language um, and many children with DLD are good at masking, which we know have impacts for quality of life. From clinical practice in schools, uh, the child with DLD might be the quiet, smiling child who doesn't cause any trouble in class, uh, but neither does he or she put up their hand, so they might not be initiating or interacting as much as they would like. Or the child who watches everything and learns from seeing others uh, to do it first, but they might be holding back um, or freeze when the teacher calls on them to answer a question. Or it could be the child that acts as the class clown uh, because they're exhausted or bored from trying to understand the language of the classroom and they may develop a reputation as the bold child. So DLD, for DLD, it may be an outward behaviour that is the sign of something going on with language, so the hidden piece. From research, we know that DLD often goes undetected by professionals, including nurses, trainee teachers, psychologists and parents. Um, while children with more physical, visible difficulties, such as speech difficulties or stuttering or dyslexia, are more likely to be identified than children with DLD alone. Often, in Ireland, the DLD is identified subsequent to behavioural attention or literacy concerns in that the school age child has already accessed some level of educational supports prior to the referral to SLT. So we know that DLD exists and that it is under identified because it's hidden. So why does it even matter? Well, there's a lot coming out in the research that tells us about the implications for DLD for reading, learning, social emotional development, inclusion, literacy, education, employment, involvement in criminal activity, mental health, quality of life. Just to give a few, 50, we know that 50 to 75% of children with DLD develop literacy problems. 
Um, a child with an undiagnosed DLD may think of themselves as stupid. And actually two children in the study um, identified with this and one said, some children make fun of me because I have that. And another said, and I am not a freak. We know that girls with DLD are three times more likely to experience sexual abuse, while boys with DLD are four times more likely to engage in delinquent behavior. And people with DLD are six times more likely than others to experience clinical levels of anxiety and three times more likely to have clinical depression. Adults with DLD are twice more likely to go over a year without employment than other adults. So clinical practice, research, and now those with DLD tell us that DLD has a significant undetermined cost to the individual, their family, and society. While the exact financial cost of DLD to the state is yet unknown in Ireland. Um, we do know from public health studies in Australia that it has a similar estimated cost to the this, this state as childhood asthma. More positively, uh, research in the UK tells us that investing just over one euro in SLT for this for children with DLD can yield over seven euro in lifetime earnings. So we know DLD exists and it's under identified and that investing resources into it can make a significant difference. So what's happening in practice in Ireland at present? There are similar but not identical models of intervention across education and SLT for children with speech language communication needs. And Ebels et al have kindly illustrated the parallels between these and the figure on the right. So you'll see ed education in red and speech and language therapy in black with differences noted at tier three. For the needs of children with DLD in school to be addressed, the three tiers of intervention need to be undertaken. So tier one is intervention at a universal level and that's support for all. And this is classroom level supports. In education, this may include things like literacy lift off or visual schedules for the class. Supports that are needed for some but benefit all. It also includes awareness and identification of speech language communication needs such as DLD. Preventative strategies such as vocabulary enrichment programs which can be whole school or whole class initiatives. At this tier, speech and language therapists have a role in advocating for awareness and identification of speech language communication needs such as DLD, providing education sessions, uh, identifying um, facilitative communication strategies and classroom modifications and um, screenings. So tier two then is interventions at a targeted level, and this is support for some. In education, this may be support delivered in groups in the class through station teaching or in a pull out model. And this used to be termed learning support. So here the child did or does not require a diagnosis, but might be struggling in some aspects of the curriculum or school life. For speech and language therapy, um, it's programs recommended by the SLT, but run by the school for the at risk children. And they might be at risk due to family history, illness, poor attendance, low socioeconomic status uh, or, or other reasons and can include programs such as word aware, Lego therapy or within the education, things like reading recovery. And tier three then is interventions at a specialist level. And this is support for a few. Until a few years ago in Ireland in education, these children received support that was returned as resource hours. And children were granted this level of educational support based on having a diagnosis. So having that report, whether it was DLD or DCD or ADHD. However, a few years ago, there was a shift in education away from diagnosis led support um, to needs led support. And consequently, learning support at tier two and resource teacher teaching at tier one were merged and termed SET or special educational teaching. So now support is given at the discretion of the school, that is, what level of supports are allocated to individuals is decided by the child's current needs, not diagnosis, which makes sense, given the changing profile of needs over the child's school life. Intervention at this level for SLT can take two forms. So you have the indirect, which is individualized SLT programs developed for the school that are modeled and monitored closely by SLT, but given to the special educational teacher to carry out. 
And ideally, the SLT may visit regularly. And the research tells us that ideally that we would be monitoring and modeling um, the intervention um, on a weekly basis and then two weekly. I imagine in reality, we're doing well to get in monthly or two monthly, um, and that'll vary depending on area. And or B then is the direct um, intervention at this level, which can be one to one therapy or small group speech and language therapy sessions with SLT in clinic or school. So we know from the research that children with DLD, in particular those with receptive language disorders, require tier three SLT intervention. In Ireland, majority of children with an identified DLD attend a mainstream class in a mainstream school and attend SLT in a community clinic. They may receive some level of SLT and education intervention at one or all levels of the continuum, but this may vary depending on the school and the local SLT staffing and resources available. So many might get a review and a programme sent out to the school um, and in other areas, they may be getting um, more one-to-one -one or group support also in clinic. And then there are a limited few attending a special DLD or SSLD language class, which is a jointly funded venture by Health and Education with SLT provided in school for this small class of seven children. And this model, I feel, allows for true tier three intervention to take place. However, there are a limited number of these in uh, primary schools nationwide. I think we have 64 this year. So while SLTs work at all three levels, in practice, there is significant pressure to provide tier three intervention, which means there is little time for tier two and even less time for tier one SLT interventions where health promotion initiatives lie. So how can we help children with DLD if they're not identified and we don't have time to work at tier one as required. So here comes the research. So this qualitative research is the first part of a multi-phased research that looked into the where, with whom, and how to increase identification of children with DLD in Ireland, more specifically in the West of Ireland. So the where focused on the school setting, um, most specifically JESH schools, so delivering equality uh, in schools, uh, where DLD, we think, is hidden in plain sight. We know DLD in Ireland is most often diagnosed during the primary school years. We know that from health promotion studies that schools are an important setting to target in relation to identification of risk factors and for the introduction of prevention uh, strategies for childhood neurodevelopmental difficulties. Children from low socioeconomic backgrounds and those with special educational needs such as DLD are twice as likely to attend JESH schools here in Ireland. With whom? So teachers, most activities undertaken in the classroom rely on language. There is a strong relationship between impaired language skills and negative behaviour that often goes undetected by teachers or psychologists. Educating teachers about speech, language and communication needs in particular has been shown to increase recognition and onward referral to services elsewhere. So by how? By asking those who know. So engaging the key stakeholders, children with DLD and teachers. So early exploratory studies on training and service development needs is an important element to ensure that health promotion initiatives are carefully targeted. The Health Promotion Strategic Framework and Schools for Health in Ireland has highlighted that a multifaceted collaborative approach is the most effective in achieving health and educational outcomes. So by gaining the contextual and priority needs from the stakeholders in relation to the knowledge gaps, and the methods of engagement, we hope to increase the likelihood of successful outcome in health promotion. Including the voice of the child with DLD um, aimed to ensure that any outcomes were acceptable and meaningful ones. So what did we need to ask? So the three research questions that we had were, one, how do teachers and children with DLD describe the condition? Two, what do stakeholders identify as priority areas for intervention to meet DLD needs in school? And three, 
what strategies do stakeholders identify as acceptable in relation to supporting DLD in school? And these were asked with the hope that the findings from these questions um, in the qualitative phase of this research, phase one, would inform the development of a locally responsive, acceptable health promotion intervention for teachers about DLD in schools. So the methodological considerations. This research was subjectivist in nature. Um, that is, it is understood that knowledge is socially constructed. Um, it was most closely aligned with subtle realism and we were striving for objectivity. Uh, as a result, transparency, rigor, um, and credibility were of concern in the planning. So we I used the COREG 23 questions um, and critical reflection during analysis, systematic recording of analytical decisions and member checking of the transcripts for accuracy. And then ethics um, was obtained through ATU and through the HSE. So the methods. So purposeful sampling was undertaken because we had specific questions and we wanted to get the answers from specific people. So it was to ensure the perspectives of the individuals with the unique knowledge and experience of the topic were included. Previous research has shown differences in, in perspectives between uh, the, the different stakeholder groups. So that's why we want both teachers and children. So what did I do? Sent out emails with informed consent sheets uh, to the principals in the primary level Jesh schools in our County Galway, so it was N47 at the time, inviting interested teachers and children with DLD to participate. Identification then of children who met the inclusion exclusion criteria was facilitated by uh, local primary care SLTs and the school's SEN coordinators. Uh, inclusion criteria for children included that they were primary school, aged between 9 and 12, and they were in a Jewish school and had a diagnosis of DLD. So the sample included seven teachers um, that you can see there. Uh, three were from an urban school and uh, four from a rural school. And I had more female teachers than male teachers and a range of different roles within the educational setting. And they um, were seen across two focus groups. And then the children... I had, um, uh, there were, were seven children as well, and again, between rural and urban school, and most of the children were seen individually. Two were seen in a, in a pod, because this was gathered during COVID, so I'll talk about that again in a few minutes. But this is um, what the children, um, the participant details look like. So uh, we undertook, I undertook focus groups, to facilitate rich discussion and to allow exploration of the commonality and differences in views. So I developed a topic guide, which was guided by the principles of narrative inquiry. And I use this approach because it allows for participants to share their experiences with minimal prompting from the interviewer. The topic guides were piloted with teachers prior to the study. Uh, everything was audio recorded. Um, and I took field notes during the focus groups and audio recorded reflective memos afterwards. Um, and all of these were integrated with the transcripts to inform the analysis and transcripts from the teachers were member checked prior to analysis. So the teacher focus groups, so there was three in one and four in another, were about 60 minutes long. Um, and the type of questions that I asked um, were... And actually, if before focus group one, the teachers had actually asked me to send on um, the questions so they had access to them beforehand. And then I provided them with pen and paper um, at the focus group. So first question I asked was, think for a moment about a service professional you liaised with in relation to a child in your school that has a special educational need. Think of a service professional that stands out in your mind, for example, social worker, family support, psychology, physiotherapy, speech and language therapy, OT. Jot down some details about your story of working with that service. And there were some probe questions then that I issued at that time. So who was there? Who were the people that stand out? When was it? Why was it a memorable experience? What worked well? What did not work well? What was your feeling towards the service professional? What was your learning from dealing with that service? Um, and then we came together as a group and um, each teacher had a chance to tell the group about it and give as much detail as a time. So they, they had an open floor to talk. And um, so what happened was teachers took their turn and they were very good and went around in, in the circle. Uh, but also there was a lot more chat generated between them and different discussions. 
The second question that was asked was to similar format, but think for a moment about a child with DLD, SSLD that you worked with that stands out in your memory and, and then the same type of probing questions. So for children, then I met with them twice. And this just allowed for time to establish rapport, to illustrate the techniques and um, to introduce myself. And I had a practice question. The children created a pseudonym for themselves. Um, I explained the red and the green card. Um, so the green card was to signal their need for more language support. And the red card was uh, to signal withdrawal of assent. Um, so the individual interviews lasted about 15 minutes each. So they each child had two of those. And then the paired interview lasted 25 minutes. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, these two children were in the same class and they were so they were in the same pot. So I was allowed to see them together. It was actually meant to be one more child, but she was unwell that day. So she was the child that I ended up seeing um, on an online platform. But the paired interview, I didn't have to do much at all, uh, except take note. Uh, it was really interesting. They they chatted amongst themselves um, and, and the drawing technique really helped with that. Um, yeah, so the drawn tile was, was very helpful because it just reduced the pressure for them to have to communicate uh, verbally. So the questions that I asked the children, there was a settling question. And then later when I met them, I orientated them again. Uh, for some children it was after their break time. Uh, for some children it was just later in that day. It was question one, think about something you're good at, like doing in school. And here's some paper and colours. And then there was some probing questions. And the second question was, think about the best teacher you ever had. Um, here is some paper and colours and draw right down. And the follow up questions were what you liked about this teacher, what made this teacher different or the best? What did she or he do that you liked? How the teacher made you feel? So it was really interesting listening to them. So data analysis. I used a framework analysis approach because it was systematic, flexible and efficient. And I think efficiency was the key because I was gathering all this data with the aim of gathering all this data um, prior to to the Christmas, so the first term to use it for the second part of the research. Um, framework analysis is a little bit different to other methods of data analysis and qualitative research. Um, it has seven phases. So the first phase, uh, the first stage is transcription. So that was me transcribing the data. Familiarity with the data, so reading over it and over it. Um, coding. This was open coding. So it's e this was an inductive process. So based on the information from the cases, so each individual was a, called a case. Uh, so each teacher I open generated open codes based on the data that was gathered. Next was identifying the best fit analytical framework. So choosing which one. I'll come to that in a second. Then it was applying the framework. So that was deductive charting because the framework itself had the themes and categories. So I took the open codes and plotted those in for each individual first. So each teacher individually, each child individually. Charting data into the framework matrix. So then it was refining of the deductive charting of the data within participant groups. So the teachers as a group and the children as a group. And then lastly, interpreting the data. So this was analysis across the participant groups to identify similarities and differences. So the term theme here is actually used to refer to the predetermined domains of the framework rather than um, interpretive themes. Um, and, and that can be chosen a priori or during the analysis. So I chose the biopsychosocial model ICF because it is used across, across health and education research. Um, and for me, it placed the child in the center, but it also incorporated concepts related to the child's health condition and functioning in addition to the environmental influences um, in relation to participation. And it also allowed for functional facilitators and barriers to be identified within contextual factors. The findings, of which there were many. Oh, apologies. So here we have looking at the open codes. This is figure one. Looking at the open codes organized within each category of the five themes of the ICF, you can see it's clear that contextual factors is the most dominant theme. Um, most specifically, um, uh, environmental factors and within that natural environment and human made changes and services and systems and policies. So this is unsurprising given that the research took a specific focus on DLD with a setting based health promotion approach. 
Interestingly, uh, personal factors, um, sorry now, or it is the second most discussed theme, uh, followed by participation activities and body structure and function. So it kind of worked its way back up. And this figure gives an overview of the teachers and children's priority areas for intervention and change, many of which can be under understood to sit at the universal level of service delivery. And the framework, while not perfect, allowed for the most dominant themes to emerge while still capturing additional data related to the understanding or lack thereof of the impairment. So I'll just go through the main themes and some of the uh, comments that the teachers and children made. So body structure and function. Um, this was the least discussed topic um, and was discussed primarily by the teachers. And the teachers expressed a lack of clarity in relation to diagnostic terminology when referring to DLD. And they were actually noted to use a variety of terms. So severe receptive language delay, speech and language difficulties. Children did not use diagnostic labels. Instead, they referred to their language abilities in descriptive terms. Um, perhaps because they didn't know it or hadn't been told that they had DLT or um, maybe it's just not a term that was being used. So one child said, uh, when I was younger, I didn't really know how to talk that well. Um, yeah, and a teacher had said, and you can nearly see it in him. Like if, if you'd say something, you could see him trying to process it in his head. So referring back to what um, the, the body structure and function and what was going on. And another child said, oh, because I do it in my head, I do it in my brain, when he was talking about problem solving. So activities, this is the execution of a task or an action by an individual. And this was discussed by both teachers and children. And both sets of participants reported that practical subjects were relatively easier for children with DLD as they aid concentration. So things like art and maths. So T5, he would lose himself in art and while he was doing anything with his hands. Um, and C4, at first I just do it my own. Now I'm being creative from my head. Teacher comments were related to directly observable behaviours, such as poor speech, has very, very bad pronunciation, um, difficulties, and when children use phrases to avoid responding. So I don't know, that was his response to everything. Whereas the children commented more on difficulties related to listening and attention. Um, and sometimes I really can't focus. And um, perhaps this related back to feedback they received from adults as a number of children commented on how they did not like being told when they weren't listening. And that came up later as well. So participation. This was discussed by both groups. Um, children tended to report on their successes in participating in classroom, um, such as when they were engaged in tasks like explaining and describing or when they were producing artifacts, and practical activities or when they got something right. So one time I got two letters right. That was C5, C7, 19 I have. And the child was talking about dojo points, um, which is a reward system in class. And C2, because sometimes I be first and sometimes I be second. A lot of the times I was first. Um, this contrasted with the teachers who referred more to children's restrictions, uh, particularly in terms of social skills, um, taking turns, contributing to classroom discussions and in having friends. Um, so it, it was much harder for him to participate in class discussions. That was T1. Uh, T2, uh, he finds it very hard to follow rules and wait for his turn. He has no friends. And uh, T1 there, the top one in blue, this was really profound for me because it was one of the, the first um, pieces of data that, that was gathered. And um, it was really useful in informing the next stage of the research. So one teacher said, you have to wonder why they are not participating. Are they not understanding me? Are they not able to process what I'm saying? Do they not have the language? And um, so it was really interesting to hear that from the teacher's perspective. They're wondering, you know, the why asking those questions. So environmental factors, then there was there was four categories under this theme. And this was the most frequently discussed theme by both groups. So the first category was natural environment and human made changes. And both both groups described the critical role that the classroom teacher plays in meeting the needs of the child with DLD and identified strategies that they have found helpful and ineffective. So things that were helpful included quiet, calm space where the child felt that he or she belonged. 
rewards, movement breaks, keeping instructions short, agreeing ways of asking for clarification in the classroom, pace, giving the child time to answer, the use of role reversal uh, and the use of visual supports. A uh, teacher said that asking the child to repeat back instructions immediately after hearing them to check their understanding was also effective. Ineffective strategies that the children identified were negative attention when they weren't listening. So it's not the children felt it's not that I'm not listening um, and they didn't like when that was being said to them. Teachers identified high teacher workload, uh, setting tasks with language heavy demands and the physical constraints of the building, such as the noisy classroom. So one child said, oh, he's really nice. And if the whole class is messing, he still doesn't give us a lot of work. And C6 said, he says, when we need help, just ask him. So really simple, really straightforward. So the second category in this theme was attitudes. Children noted that they had experienced situations where teachers and peers were unsupportive. Teachers also noted that there can be some negative attitudes towards children with SEN in schools um, on the part of the teachers, but that this was mainly where the teachers did not have additional training and how to support the child with needs. Um, so I think what was said there was it's not taught in college. So DLD with the teachers are not taught about in the undergrad. Uh, the category supports and uh, relationships. So a trusting professional relationship with the SLT was seen as a facilitator. Regular communication between the SLT and the teacher. Conversely, having limited or no contact from the SLT was a barrier to meeting the needs of the child with DLD. And where the SLT service provided a programme of activities for individuals to carry out with therapy techniques even being modelled, it wasn't always feasible for the teacher to implement these in a classroom setting. So um, one teacher said to T3, I think it's important that there is somebody at the end of the phone that can say, that's great stuff. That'll be normal for a child at that level. Keep doing it and come back to me in another couple of weeks. And the final category in this theme was services, supports and policies. Uh, here, the role of the special educational teacher uh, was seen as particularly important as they were thought to have more time to fully understand a child's language profile and to deliver the individualised supports. Teachers also stated a preference for in-school based SLT services. And the advantages then of the special class or the language class for pupils um, was described. Uh, a variety of issues in relation to SLT services were discussed by teachers. Um, I don't think these are uh, a surprise for anybody, but they included things like the um, inappropriate or unrealistic service access criteria for certain services, long gaps in service delivery due to minimal staffing and logistical barriers for parents where SLT services were only provided in primary care centres. And children also commented on not liking leaving school to go to the clinic. So one child talked about how he walked, used to walk to the health centre from school and come back. Um, but now he was receiving in school and he, he preferred that. He said um, he was better. He said, yeah, because then you don't have to walk for hours and hours to the clinic. You just go to school and say like, hey, I'm here. And she's like, great. Um, he same child also commented on uh, aspects of the health centre, including small furniture and the smell. Um. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the last um theme was personal factors, and it was the second most discussed theme. And there was two categories provided by the SCF under this domain, um, which included somewhat changeable factors where teachers knew and actively sought to tap into the child's hobbies and interests, and common activities discussed by children as promoting positive feelings included reading, playing with Lego, drawing and time in the outdoors and a supportive family and home life where they could relax and be themselves was valued by children. So because I don't have to do any work and I can be on my own and I can do anything for myself. That's C4 when he was talking about why he likes his room. And well, at home, I can slam the door so I can be calmer. Then at school, I normally just don't talk to people. So they were talking about C6 is if he was feeling um, cross or angry. Teachers reported that parents' understanding of how services work was an important factor that could be supported to help secure supports for the child in school. 
So T2, that's half the battle just to get the parents on board first. And T1, I just thought she needed an advocate with her at the appointments because she wouldn't be able to tell me, you know, she wouldn't be able to relay back that information. Teachers also discussed the resilience of the child as an important, mutable factor which could be improved. And then lastly, the largely unchangeable factors, teachers discussed some factors related to the child's home life that as being problematic and um, things that couldn't be changed, such as culture or genetics, family history um, and having English as an additional language. And actually having uh, another language at home was identified as being a disadvantage for children with DLD, as well as pre presenting barriers to communication with parents. So one child C4 said, no, I never knew how to speak English until I started going to school. Uh, really weirdly, a weird feeling. So he, he felt weird about that. Um, and uh, one teacher said T2, it's very hard to get to the bottom between the parents. Are they saying they're OK in their own language or the parents don't know? So this is the summary, figure two, of all of the, the rich findings that we gathered. At the level of body structure and functions, it was evident that there was an inconsistent use of terminology and that was a barrier to promoting awareness, knowledge and actions. Within activities, there was a lack of emphasis and or knowledge on the specific hidden characteristics of DLD, with teachers focusing more on what was visible. Participation was seen as the primary indicator of the child's functioning and used to determine, determine the extent of the disability. So what the child was actually doing in the class was what the children uh, and um, teachers valued most. And then environmental factors. So here, teachers were identified by both groups as the key agents in facilitating successful functioning in the school setting, uh, setting and both groups identified increased school based services were required. And at the level of personal factors, there was increased parental awareness and support needed to facilitate successful parent teacher collaboration and resilience was also identified as key to the child's success. So if we think back to the three research questions, how do children and teachers with DLD describe the condition? Well, differently, teachers focused on terminology and what the children could not do, uh, whereas the children were more descriptive about their needs and talk about what they could do. What do stakeholders identify as priority areas for intervention to meet DLD? Well, environmental changes, namely more, more understanding, more knowledge, more speech and language therapy, more training for teachers, more support for teachers, um, and more in-school and in-class adaptations. And three, what strategies do stakeholders identify as acceptable in relation to supporting DLD in school? Well, this ranged from service level to classroom level, things like larger tables, more fresh air, movement breaks, quieter classrooms, and the use of facilitative techniques, such as feeling allowed to ask for help, repetition of instructions, fun, so the discussion, we're nearly there. Um, the key implications, well, consistent with inclusive education policy, optimising the classroom environment for children with DLD was the priority focus of intervention for both groups. In relation to the children's views, the findings add to the increasing evidence base that points to the preference on the part of children with DLD to be supported alongside their peers in school. And a focus on universal level interventions on DLD for DLD, such as methods of increasing learning opportunities in the classroom, may be an important element of health promotion uh, interventions for schools. There is continued terminological confusion with the concerning gap um, in knowledge in relation to the nature of the condition, both of which have negative implications for the accurate identification of DLD. So there is a need for continued targeted public health interventions to increase awareness of terminology and hidden characteristics of DLD in schools in Ireland. Consistent with previous studies, this study shows the importance of gaining the children's views about what practical facilitative communication strategies are and are not acceptable to them in classroom in relation to their language needs. And we need to acknowledge and incorporate the knowledge the children can bring to avoid any unintended negative consequences. And in terms of SLT services, 
It was really positive that teachers were committed to collaborative working with SLTs. Um, they spoke of the need for regular contact with SLTs to sustain the meaningful relationships. Um, and they noted the poor access to supports. School-based services that do exist in Ireland, with the exception of the special DLD SSLD class settings, are predominantly consultative rather than collaborative. So, and we know that this is ineffective and likely not to meet the needs of the children with DLD in schools. So it is important to include information on SLT best practice guidelines in relation to DLD in a health promotion intervention, in addition to information on how to contact services and or how teachers may need to support parents to advocate for SLT services in school for their child. So the strengths and limitations. Well, there was careful recruitment and use of narrative techniques. Um, very cognizant that views are not representative of all, it's just a small portion of children in the west of Ireland. Uh, parents and other stakeholders were not included. And while the ICF model was chosen for um, analysis as the best fit, we are aware that the impairment level does not fully capture DLD. So in conclusion, we gathered important insights to guide a health promotion intervention that is locally responsive to the needs of a cluster of schools in the west of Ireland. It's encouraging to note that teachers in the study acknowledge the importance of their role as agents of change in the classroom and in enabling the achievement and participation of children of DLD. However, it is evident that targeted efforts are required to increase awareness and knowledge of the condition, such that teachers are able to identify the hidden disorder in schools. So the future implications were that this information was used to then design, deliver and measure the impact of a locally responsive educational intervention for teachers on awareness, knowledge and actions. And actions included things like meaningful facilitative uh, strategies, use of those, identification and onward referral to, uh, to SLT. So and that's related to, to DLD in schools. So that is the end of my presentation um, based on the paper. Um, I hope you will join with us in um, celebrating DLD Day on the 18th of October. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions. Thank you so much, Marie. That was so interesting. And um, I um, confess that I, I haven't worked with DLD since I was a student, so um, it's been a long time. So that was a, a good education for me or an update for me on the area, um, as well as an interesting overview of all of your, your findings. So I'm going to invite everyone who's attended uh, the webinar to ask questions via the Q&A function. Um, but while people may be preparing questions, I might start off with one of my own, if that's OK. Um, and. What I'm interested in is um, I, I, I'm thinking about the fact that your research was on a certain geographical area within Ireland, and I appreciate that some of the findings may be specific to that locality. But I also wondered whether some of your findings might be something that would, um, how can I put it, I suppose, would still carry over on the international stage in the sense that you know, were, were there any findings that are maybe already mirrored in recommendations for children with DLD um, or recommendations for educational settings? Or were there things that maybe came up that you said, well, this doesn't have to be just about this region. You know, this this this, this applies internationally. Was there anything like that that you sort of felt would be advice? Yeah, abso absolutely, Kieran. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I suppose there's a couple of things going through my head when you were asking is that absolutely, I suppose. But it did concur with findings from other research, both in Ireland um, in a speech from a speech and language therapy perspective. Um, so Eva Gallagher's work, uh, Eva Gallagher's al's work, but also from studies that was done uh, through the NCSE in education in post primary schools. Um, and then I suppose if you're looking more internationally, I, the findings, if you look over at Rattle and the beautiful resources they have av made available on strategies to support children. And then identifying children, a lot of those strategies are actually the ones 
that overlapped with the, that um children were finding useful but pacing um one question at a time so so those ones were ones that I you'd see overlapping um on a more international ones that we're I suppose already promoting are some that are already working did that answer your question no no it did sorry I took me a minute to find my unmute button um no absolutely it did thank you and as, as I was listening to the presentation I also thought um gosh some of my primary school teacher friends would benefit from hearing this actually and had I thought about saying it to them I, I would have invited them today but um I'm just wondering whether you have any I mean I, I I appreciate that we have to draw the line somewhere but um are there any thoughts or plans or maybe there have already been some some actions in terms of engaging teachers about some of these recommendations um absolutely more yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose phase two, I don't want a spoiler alert because it hasn't been written yet from from a publishing point of view. But we did. I did go on and do the rest and deliver an educational intervention and um, with pre post surveys. And on the back of that and learnings that, you know, webinars that are interactive can be effective, just as effective as talking face to face um, once there's the opportunity and making it as real as possible. So having had a pilot a few times on the back of that and the learnings from the second part of the research within our area, we were in a position to develop teacher training, a series of teacher training. Um, myself and a colleague of mine and with, with um, permission and support from management developed uh, the communication, communicating together teacher training series, which we rolled out. Uh, so it was a series of five webinars, which we offered for free to all uh, primary secondary school teachers in uh, Galway County and city. So that rolled out uh, for two years consistently. Yeah, so that was that was where it went next for well, us. Well, fair, fair play, that's, a, that's not an inconsiderable piece of, piece of work. And actually you've just made me realize as well that um, I suppose a cohort that I certainly haven't thought very much about um, and I, I suspect are probably underrepresented in research are um, these children as they do become older and go into secondary school absolutely so, yeah. yeah and uh, you know and uh, this research was focused in primary school but we're very cognizant that there is a lot of work to be done at transition phases as well as um a secondary school and, and adulthood yeah thanks great John. okay and we just have a question in here um so what what do you think maria um the reasons are as to why public awareness of dld is is so low um, and what steps do you think we could take as a profession to try and improve this? OK, I think that there's a couple of answers to that. I think definitely. And I and I did talk about terminology and I know I kind of laboured on at the start, but I do it for a reason, because I think the fact that there have been over 600 terms and even as a profession, speech and language therapist for many years, we weren't using one consistent term. That's very hard to, to know about something if you haven't got a name for it. Now we have a name and now we're pro trying to promote the awareness of it. Um, I think resources, unfortunately, is a big one. Um, we're trying as a profession to work hard to give, you know, uh, evidence based research working at that tier one level that often there isn't the same level of time for tier two, tier three, which is the identification. Um, uh, you know, to, there isn't the time. I do think webinars are one way. I think promoting the rattled. I also look at into screening. I think that could be a way forward. Um, but I suppose that this piece of research was trying to find out well what is known, what's out there on the ground, uh, in Ireland in this area, and what are the needs first. But I would certainly be looking towards things like screening going forward. But you need buy-in. Because that's, uh, I have a lot of friends who are teachers. I've worked in a lot of schools and they're already overworked, um, like many, many professions. So handing another piece of work without buy-in, it's, it's unfair and um, ineffective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much. And then there was just a, a follow up on that, um, which we might just address very, very briefly in the interest of time. But do you think that... Um, it might take an improvement in evidence-based practice or improvements in quality or quantity of research in DLD before we actually get buy-in for improving services or resources in this area. Um, do you think that's a barrier or does the barrier... So do you think improvement in research? I think there's a lovely uh, piece of work out there on, I don't know, is this the right term, health economics. I'd love to qualify somebody who is better at numbers than me in statistics to identify the cost of DLD to the state. I mean, I know the research I touch on um, with Cronin and it was based in, in Australia, but just to know how much it is actually impacting the state. I think numbers speak. So yes, is my answer. Um, I think as a, as a cohort, the children with DLD, 
um, and their families often don't have an advocate. It is left to us and to teachers, whereas other neurodiverse conditions may be able to speak out for themselves and tell people what they want themselves, what, the, what their needs are and how to best meet those needs. So I do think there is an onus that falls back on those of us working with them. But yes, more research. I think if we were able to quantify it accurately um, and identify them, the, those families and children with DLD and show the government look, this is how much it's costing. And then on the flip side, if we invest in these families, in these children, in these services, um, we could build from there. Brilliant. Yes, no, and I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, uh, I think I think as a profession, we can advocate as much as we want for the different things that we do. But um, I think the people in, in power who control the, the purse strings need to, need to see the bottom line sometimes, yeah. don't they? So, um, so Maria... Karen and Aoife, collectively, well done on your piece of work. Thank you so much for presenting that today. Thank um, you. It was really enjoyable. Um, thank you, everybody who joined us online. Um, and just a reminder as well, on behalf of myself and Julie as co-editors of the journal and of the editorial board, um, that we always welcome submissions in any area related to communication and swallowing. Um, and we'd be delighted to see more interesting and exciting research like Maria's uh, come to the journal. So. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks again, Maria. Um, and thank you to Tris in Trinity who hosted this webinar on our behalf as well. Um, and we hope you'll join us for our next webinar um, in uh, autumn. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.